Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Mrs. Smith knew that this day would come someday, but she didn't think it would happen so quickly. Just last week, she had heard the shopkeepers whispering about their store closing soon. However, she didn't pay much attention to such conversations because she believed in her uniqueness. Nowadays, these are the times when janitors are in high demand. In essence, it's the most sought-after profession. Everyone is striving to become managers, and no one wants to mop the floors. So, in just a decade, the janitor profession became scarce. These thoughts warmed Mrs. Smith's heart and allowed her to believe in financial stability. At least for the next five years. She mentally encouraged herself. No one will envy my piece of bread. Will these well-dressed beauties stoop down to a bucket with a mop? Mrs. Smith cast an unfriendly glance in the direction where the young saleswomen had gathered to gossip. The girls were discussing something too loudly and didn't even spare a passing glance at the janitor. Although Mrs. Smith had never experienced social discomfort, this time she felt the condescending attitude of the younger generation. To compensate for her losses due to the humiliation, she walked so close to the group that the wet mop accidentally touched the tanned legs of one of the girls. The girl immediately stepped aside. Can't you be more careful? What's with waving that mop around? Mrs. Smith remained unfazed and unembarrassed, she walked into the storage room with an indifferent look, still congratulating herself on her resourcefulness. No one can prove I did it on purpose. But I put these dolls in their place. They act like they're something special, but inside, they're empty. She filled a bucket with clean water and was about to return to the sales floor to continue her important mission when the girl whose legs she had brushed with the mop entered her room. The girl stayed at a safe distance and addressed her as an object without a name or gender. The owner is calling you. She said to come immediately. First, the girl disappeared from view, and then the door slammed shut. The janitor muttered to herself. The culture here is clearly lacking. Well, I'll go and face the music. Mrs. Smith had taken this job right after her retirement. Her best friend, Mrs. Morgan, had recommended her for the position. After many years working at the library, Mrs. Smith couldn't imagine herself as a janitor. So, Mrs. Morgan had to use her persuasion skills to convince her of the benefits of this profession. Alana, don't even think twice. You can't imagine how many people want this position. The salary, though modest by today's standards, would be a decent addition to your income. I would take it myself, but my health doesn't allow it. Regarding her health, Mrs. Morgan was clearly exaggerating, as she spent her days running all over the neighborhood. For a while, Mrs. Morgan went around various organizations, offering people goods of questionable quality. Then there was a period when Vanessa sold lottery tickets, but that didn't go too well, and she eventually left that business. However, she didn't miss it for long because someone she knew helped her get a good position. Mrs. Morgan was so happy that she didn't hesitate to disturb her friend at 10 o'clock at night. She appeared in person and declared with solemnity. Alana, this is my dream job. You can't even imagine how happy I am. I've found a new lease on life. Since her friend hadn't given any specific details beyond enthusiastic exclamations, Mrs. Smith touched her forehead and then asked cautiously. Vanessa. Can you at least tell me what kind of job is worth barging into someone else's house in the middle of the night? As a good actress, Mrs. Morgan paused for a moment and then said with the same solemnity. I'm now a cashier in the bus station restroom. I just finished my first day today and was trying to understand the job. This revelation was more shocking than a painful jolt. Mrs. Smith began to nervously giggle in the hallway, but her laughter was loud enough to attract Gloria's attention. Her daughter, in pajamas, rushed into the corridor. Mom. What's going on here? Are you feeling okay? This question brought Mrs. Smith back to her senses. No, dear, everything's fine. Aunt Vanessa has just found a good job and wanted to share the news. Gloria looked suspiciously at her mother and then at her friend. Yeah, they say everyone has their own quirks in their heads. Now I'm convinced that with age, these insects multiply. 
Mrs. Smith also thought that her friend might have some issues with her sanity that night if she was so thrilled about such a less prestigious job. However, time showed that prestige meant nothing compared to the benefits. Mrs. Morgan always received substantial tips in addition to her regular income. She could afford to get a manicure and a hairstyling at the salon once a week, while Mrs. Smith couldn't even remember the last time she had been to a hair salon. She had gotten used to denying herself many things because there was always a dire shortage of money in her household. That's why she clung to her job at everything for the home, store. The store was conveniently located near the residential complex where she lived, which was another plus. The store was popular among the residents of the neighborhood because their prices were lower than other places, and employees enjoyed certain benefits. In short, it had nothing but advantages, except for the owner. Mrs. Adams was a rather unpleasant person, and the store's employees were genuinely afraid of her. However, Mrs. Adams had a unique, almost friendly relationship with the janitor. This woman with a strong character had become a widow early on and had worked her way to success on her own. She started with a street vendor's stall and now owned several retail spaces. The everything for the home store brought her the highest profits. Mrs. Adams had an adult son with a family to support, and she always showed understanding for her subordinates' life difficulties. As soon as Mrs. Smith appeared at her office door, Mrs. Adams kindly asked. How's my unfortunate friend doing? Mrs. Smith sighed in response. Well, things are slowly getting better. We're managing, bit by bit. I have a similar situation. My son and his fiancé are driving me to the brink. If only I could send them somewhere for a while, I'd gladly do it. I can't handle carrying them on my back anymore. Mrs. Smith politely nodded while carefully taking a seat on the edge of a chair. Despite their shared circumstances, there was a noticeable difference in their positions. So, during her visits, the janitor tried not to violate workplace etiquette. She had learned Mrs. Adams's character well and knew that a lengthy introduction would be followed by something important. After a prolonged prelude, the main part of the conversation, aptly titled, Women's Troubles, began. Mrs. Adams stared unblinkingly at her subordinate. Mrs. Smith. We are about to make some drastic changes here. So, I decided to inform everyone in advance so they can prepare. You already know about my family problems, right? Mrs. Smith nodded silently, not yet understanding her employer's point. Mrs. Adams then continued more energetically. For years, I've struggled with a whole family of layabouts, trying to reform them, and something incredible happened. My son wants to open his own business. Perhaps a beast in the nearby forest dropped its antlers, but it happened. You understand, Alana. I can't refuse him. Mrs. Smith still didn't grasp how she was connected to Mrs. Adams's son, but she replied. Of course, Mrs. Adams. That's great. So, there won't be any problems between us. You see, my Bevis wants to open a workshop for repairing various equipment. He's a specialist in this field with a university degree. Since I don't have the extra funds, we've decided to reconfigure this store. The meaning of the owner's words finally sank in for Mrs. Smith, and she looked at her with hope. I don't mind where I mop the floors. I'll take care of cleaning in your son's workshop. Mrs. Adams said with annoyance. You still don't get it, do you? My son will be hiring an entirely new staff. Mrs. Smith persisted. But he will still need a janitor, won't he? Mrs. Adams's face turned red with anger, and she said indignantly. I told you, Bevis will be assembling a completely new team. So, as much as it pains me, I'll have to let the entire staff go. I've already offered new jobs to the department salespeople in other stores. Only you are still in limbo. In short, you have exactly one month to find a new job. Mrs. Smith understood that the conversation was over. She got up and headed for the door. Thank you for letting me know. She heard a sigh of relief behind her. No, she wasn't angry with her employer. But she thought that Mrs. Adams could have shown more consideration for her. I've worked here like a slave for nearly four years. This is my thanks for it. 
After work that day, Mrs. Smith walked home, but her legs felt heavy. The conversation with her employer continued to echo in her mind, and the future looked daunting. How are we going to survive now? Gloria's maternity leave has dragged on, and she doesn't plan to return to work. Meanwhile, Willie is already in his fifth year of school. My son-in-law is also struggling to find work and hardly contributes anything to the household. The woman decided to have a serious conversation with her family members about their future coexistence, but a new disaster awaited her at home. Her grandson spilled a cup of boiling water on himself, and his clueless parents didn't know how to help the child. They both frantically hovered around the crying baby, afraid to approach him. The grandson's screams could be heard on the first floor, and the grandmother, crazed with horror, didn't wait for the elevator. She ran upstairs, skipping every other step. It felt like her heart couldn't take it and would leap out of her chest. Upon entering the apartment, she rushed to the kitchen, where a tragedy was unfolding. Willie sat on the floor, trembling, his little hand red like a crab's claw. His parents stood frozen nearby. Mrs. Smith picked up her grandson. Why are you standing there like two mannequins? You can't do anything. You can't even be trusted with your own child. With her grandmother holding him, Willie grew quiet, only whimpering softly. She consoled the boy. Hang in there, my dear. We'll go to the doctor now, and they'll fix your little hand. Can you at least tell me how you scalded yourself? The boy mumbled. I wanted some tea. I see, and your mom didn't have time, did she? The grandson sobbed loudly, as if confirming his grandmother's version. Mrs. Smith spent nearly two hours at the clinic. Gloria rushed to the medical facility after her mother but couldn't clearly explain to the doctors how the accident happened. The attending physician listened to the young woman's incoherent speech for a long time and then said irritably, Mom, you must provide a safe environment for your child. You've probably heard from your own mother that you need to keep an eye on small children. Gloria glanced at her mother and grumbled discontentedly. How can I watch him? He runs around like a hurricane. I turned away for just a second, and he grabbed the kettle. Very often, those seconds can determine a person's life. Try not to let such incidents happen again. The doctor gave them a list of recommendations. Gloria studied the list for a long time and then said with a wry smile. Well, now we'll have to go for bandage changes every day. The young woman was about to say something else, but her mother's patience snapped. Right there in the corridor of the clinic, Mrs. Smith expressed everything she thought about her daughter and son-in-law. You'd think you've been working hard? Living a life of leisure, comfortably perched on my back. Maybe it's time to stand on your own two feet? I'm not made of iron and concrete. I might not be able to take it anymore. In short, look for a job. I'm getting fired from the store. Gloria rushed to her mother with tears in her eyes. Mom, what are you saying? What job when Willie, your grandson, needs special care? Mrs. Smith had to admit her daughter was right. She held her sleeping grandson tightly and, with a more peaceful tone, said. Okay, we'll figure something out. Maybe Vanessa can help again. Gloria looked at her mother with gratitude. Mom, you're the best. If it weren't for you, Justin and I would be in real trouble. The daughter's face bore so much suffering, and her voice sounded so sincere that Mrs. Smith mentally reproached herself for her harshness and heartlessness toward them. While holding Willie in her arms, she thought. Who else can they turn to for help if not their mother? As long as I have the strength, I will help. Feeling emotional, the woman didn't dwell on the fact that her son-in-law still had living parents, but Justin's parents didn't burden themselves with caring for their son and his family. They lived for their own pleasure and improved their health at resorts every year. Mrs. Smith didn't leave her grandson's side for three nights. Although the burns were superficial, the boy experienced intense pain. So, the mother and grandmother took turns carrying him. Taking care of her grandson temporarily pushed the job issue into the background. But the grandmother knew that the day of reckoning was approaching inexorably. She tried to talk to her daughter and son-in-law again, but Gloria skillfully avoided serious conversation, and her son-in-law declared. 
Mrs. Smith, you constantly remind me of the piece of bread you provide. But I also contribute to the family's well-being, you know. I'm just facing temporary difficulties right now. So, I kindly ask you not to artificially worsen the situation and not press me. If Mrs. Smith could forgive her daughter for some liberties, her son-in-law's audacity drove her to rage. Justin, am I not entitled to get tired as well? You're a man. Aren't you ashamed to be living off me? Her son-in-law looked at her strangely and admitted. Why should I be ashamed? I'm your daughter's lawful husband and have every right. At this point, Justin stumbled, waved his hand, and left the kitchen. Mrs. Smith felt like a wall had risen between her and the young parents. She was pounding on this partition, wanting them to hear her, but this wall was made of rubber, so it absorbed all the sounds. The woman sadly looked at her sleeping grandson and whispered. Looks like I'll have to continue carrying your cross alone. Mrs. Smith walked into the hallway, where the telephone sat on a table. She dialed a familiar combination of numbers and heard her friend's cheerful voice after a few seconds. Hello, Mrs. Morgan speaking. Vanessa, you answer the phone like an experienced operator. Alana. Is that you? Why are you calling so late? I need your help. Can I come over? Of course, you can. You didn't need to ask such silly questions. Mrs. Smith decided not to postpone her visit until tomorrow and took her coat off the hanger. However, she couldn't escape unnoticed because Gloria was drawn to the commotion in the hallway, sticking her tousled head into the slightly open door. Mom. Where are you going at this time of night? I'm going for a walk. Really, Mom? Who will look after Willie? You will. You're his mother. Sleepiness instantly vanished from Gloria's face, and she stared at her mother. The door slammed loudly, and the woman, taking a deep breath, walked down to the first floor. In Mrs. Morgan's small apartment, a special atmosphere prevailed. Mrs. Smith always felt comfortable here. She used to stay overnight at her friend's place often, but after Willie was born, the new grandmother couldn't afford such freedom anymore. Perhaps that's why her meetings with her friend had become so dear to her heart. Mrs. Morgan was bustling around the small kitchen. She moved from the stove to the table, saying. Hang on, my dear. Everything will be ready soon. An actress shared this recipe with me. I just can't remember her last name. Mrs. Smith chuckled. I didn't think that in a paid restroom, visitors would share their culinary experiences besides their main job. The hostess shook her head disapprovingly. You just couldn't resist teasing me, could you? The guest hurried to correct her mistake. Vanessa, don't be offended. I didn't mean to offend you. Moreover, I envy you so much right now. The owner of the small apartment sat down on the edge of a chair. Alana. Come on, spill the beans. What's happened to you? Has something gone wrong with the store manager? You seem to get along well with her. Yes, I have excellent rapport with Mrs. Adams. But you know that accidents happen in life when you least expect them. From the direction of the stove, a suspicious aroma wafted, and Mrs. Morgan hurriedly rushed to save her signature dish. Oops, my miracle pancakes almost burned. The woman skillfully removed the golden pancakes from the pan and placed a plate of fragrant pastries in front of her guest. Come on, enjoy. Conversations are so dull on an empty stomach. Your problem, Alana, is that you always put yourself last, and that's why you're in this sorry state. Vanessa took sour cream and a jar of jam from the fridge. These are the additions to the pancakes. The guest ate with relish while the hostess looked contemplatively at her. Alana, your dependence will drive you to an early grave. You'll soon wear yourself out with this kind of life. I won't even mention your face, which has clearly forgotten about proper care. Your hands are all wrinkled. Let's not even talk about your appearance, it's a complete disaster. A few more years of this stressful life, and you'll turn into an old lady. The guest philosophically remarked. It seems to be my fate. You know, Vanessa, lately I've been thinking more and more about the meaning of my life and realized that it's futile to try to avoid what's meant to happen. 
Mrs. Morgan was indignant. Listening to you, one would think you should put on white slippers and lie down in a coffin. As one wise man said, a person lives as long as they resist difficulties. Vanessa, you can't even imagine how hard I'm resisting. But as soon as I recover from one misfortune, a new one strikes from around the corner. Thanks for the treat, my friend, it was delicious. The guest headed toward the sink with her plate, but Mrs. Morgan stopped her. Sit down. Leave that silly plate. I'll wash it myself. Tell me, what happened to you? Vanessa, I'll be out of work soon. The owner is passing the store to her son, and he has no plans to keep the old staff. In short, I have only a month to find a new job. Alana, let your dependents do something. How long will they keep living off you? I tried talking to Gloria and my son-in-law, but it was all in vain. Mrs. Morgan slammed her fist on the table in a fit of emotion. You can't deal with them nicely. Give them an ultimatum to become self-sufficient within a month. Another heavy sigh from her friend. I've been thinking about this for a long time, but now is not the right time for drastic action. Willie scalded his hand three days ago. It was such a shock to everyone. Gloria still can't get over it. Yes, your daughter is quite the actress. She's ready for any trick to enjoy a sweet life at someone else's expense. The guest pleaded. Vanessa, don't be mad. You're absolutely right. Well, I can't set my conditions now. As soon as Willie recovers a bit, I'll tell them. Just help me find a job. You have different people coming to work every day. Maybe you'll hear something useful for me? Mrs. Smith patted her friend's hand and looked at her with the same imploring eyes. Mrs. Morgan was a sensitive person and became emotional. Okay, we'll figure something out. I won't promise anything, but I'll do my best. What kind of job suits you best? I don't really care at this point. At my age, you don't get to choose. You know that people look at us sideways. The main thing is to have some extra income. The friends parted well past midnight. Mrs. Morgan tried to convince her guest to stay, but Mrs. Smith was concerned about her grandson during her absence. Vanessa, I'd love to stay with you, but I'm afraid that while I'm gone, something else will happen to my careless children. All right, run along. As soon as something clears up, I'll give you a call. And I want to tell you, my dear friend, that it's too early for you to write yourself off. We'll fight together. It took Mrs. Morgan exactly two days to resolve her friend's employment issue. She called Mrs. Smith before lunch and joyfully announced. I have good news for you, but I'll tell you the details when we meet. Come to my bus station after work and we'll have a confidential chat. Maybe it's better to meet at your place? Vanessa laughed. Are you embarrassed by my workplace? Remember, dear. Many crucial matters are settled not in fancy offices but in unsuitable places like restrooms. By the way, my establishment is impeccably clean and I comfortably have tea and lunch there. In short, I'm waiting for you. Mrs. Smith barely waited for the end of her workday and hurried to meet her friend. Mrs. Morgan didn't want to keep her friend in suspense and, after exchanging greetings, got straight to the point. I cast my line yesterday. I have an acquaintance who works at the labor exchange. She has access to all the lists of available vacancies in the city. She was the one who suggested that there's an urgent need for a janitor at a construction company's office. The position has been vacant for a long time because the director is too particular. Can you imagine, he organized a real casting for the position of a janitor. I wonder how he selects accountants, drivers, and other staff. Mrs. Morgan was witty in her choice of words and didn't immediately notice the sudden change in her friend's expression. But when she saw how pale Mrs. Smith had become, she rushed to her side. Alana, what's wrong with you? Is it your heart acting up? Maybe I should give you some medication? No, everything's fine. It'll pass. Although, no, give me the medicine. Everything Mrs. Morgan needed was within reach, and she quickly retrieved her first aid kit from her desk drawer. After adding the prescribed dose of heart medication to a glass of water, she said. 
You really scared me with that. Mrs. Smith took the medicine and placed the glass back on the table. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. It's just that my late husband, Morty, used to work at that construction company. Mrs. Morgan sighed and covered her mouth with her hand. I'm sorry, Alana. I couldn't have known. In that case, we'll pass on that job. You shouldn't go there. Vanessa, wait. I don't have a choice. The deadline given to me by the landlady is approaching, and I'll be left with nothing. Besides, I heard that after that incident, some oligarch bought up that construction company along with everything else. Maybe I'm mistaken, and there's another company with the same name. No, you're right. My acquaintance told me a similar story. The current owner of the company is a certain Mr. Scott. Does that name ring a bell to you? Mrs. Smith thought for a moment, then shook her head in the negative. No, I've never heard of him. If you want, I can find out more details. No, Vanessa, there's no need. I'll visit the company myself and gather all the information on the spot. Thank you for your help. You're a true friend, and I'm lucky to have such a reliable support. The city was sound asleep as Mrs. Smith walked through the deserted streets, pondering the twists and turns of her fate. Although her conversation with Vanessa had lightened her heart somewhat, a deep-seated worry lingered somewhere deep beneath her heart. No, she wasn't afraid for herself. What worried this loving mother and grandmother the most was her daughter's and grandson's future. She mentally reproached herself. Gloria is not at all prepared for independent life, and it's my fault. I was always busy with work and didn't devote enough time to my child. An inner voice immediately countered. You had no other choice, Alana, so stop blaming yourself. She tried not to make noise in the hallway, but Gloria still crawled out of her bedroom as soon as her mother crossed the apartment threshold. She whispered reproachfully. You finally showed up. Willie was being difficult all evening. He was waiting for you. It's nothing, dear. I'll make up for it tomorrow. I'm not just strolling around, I'm looking for a job. Gloria emitted an indistinct sound resembling a grunt and disappeared behind her bedroom door. Mrs. Smith tiptoed into her room. Despite her exhaustion, she couldn't fall asleep because memories were flashing in her mind. Life hadn't been kind to Alana. Instead, troubles had rained down on her since childhood. She was the eldest in the family, and after her father left for another woman, all the responsibilities for her two younger brothers and sister fell on her fragile shoulders. To provide for the children, her mother worked two jobs and took on additional work on weekends. She was a painter-plasterer, a highly sought-after profession. Mrs. Mitchell, her mother, often said to her eldest daughter, Take an example from me. Go and study to become a painter-plasterer. You'll always have a piece of bread on the table. But Alana had different plans for her future. She wanted to enroll in a library college. However, she didn't dare to share her intentions with her mother, who had a very tough personality. Neighbors and acquaintances spoke about her. Mrs. Mitchell has nerves of steel and unyielding perseverance. She's a man in a woman's disguise. Indeed, for many years, Mrs. Mitchell stoically endured all the hardships of everyday life. But she broke down when the most devastating sorrow for any mother befell her, the loss of a child. No, Conan, the youngest in the family, did not die from an incurable illness. He literally disappeared while returning from the city with his mother on the commuter train. At that time, they lived in a workers' settlement that was located very close to the city limits. Housing construction was proceeding at an incredible pace, and the parents hoped to secure an apartment in the new development. However, the father never lived to see this happen and left for another family. As a result, they received the apartment without him and the youngest brother. But while the settlement was still listed as a separate locality, the commuter train was the most popular mode of transportation among its residents. On that fateful day, Mrs. Mitchell set off with her young son to the clinic to get him vaccinated. She had to take time off work for this preventive measure, which saddened her greatly. There was our own clinic nearby. No, it bothered someone, and they demolished it ahead of schedule. 
Now, I have to travel to the city every month to get a certificate for the daycare or have vaccinations done, and this is a full working day for which no one will pay me. Alana remembers offering her mother help. Mom, let me take Conan to the doctor. It's not difficult for me at all. Mrs. Mitchell immediately rejected this offer. Can I trust you with such a responsibility? You'll open your mouth, and you'll lose the child, or you'll get lost yourself. The woman seemed to have summoned misfortune upon herself. After visiting the pediatric clinic, she and her son rushed back to catch the commuter train to get home earlier. In the midst of this rush, she forgot about everything, and when they boarded the train, and she urgently needed to step aside for a moment, she asked a fellow passenger for a favor. Could you please watch my little boy? I'll be quick. The elderly woman gladly agreed to her request. Don't worry. I'll watch the child. But when Mrs. Mitchell returned, neither her son nor the woman was in their seats. During her absence, the train had made a brief stop. But the distraught mother didn't want to believe that a stranger had left with her child at that station. The disappearance of the child was immediately reported to the police. Conan was initially searched for in all nearby villages. Then the search expanded, but weeks and months passed, and the boy was never found. This tragedy was the first terrible loss in Alana's life. After that incident, Mrs. Mitchell became completely withdrawn. She blamed herself for everything. The unfortunate woman voluntarily abandoned her usual life and joined a commune. Soon, the mother completely withdrew from her children's lives and eventually quit her job. The elder daughter tried to bring her mother back to life, but she responded to any comments with aggression. We are all sinners on this earth. And you're a sinner too, but you can only redeem your sin through prayer. Mrs. Mitchell prayed day and night. She often left home for several days, and once she disappeared for a whole month. When her mother finally returned home, Alana realized that her mother's mental health was not well. The woman was placed in a specialized facility. There were periodic improvements, and she was released home, but the bright moments were short-lived, and the eldest daughter had to monitor every step of her ailing mother. Fortunately, by that time, they had already obtained a larger apartment in a new district of the city. The workers' settlement, where her childhood and youth had passed, ceased to exist. The younger brother and sister didn't want to stay in their family home and went their separate ways. Soon, Mrs. Mitchell herself passed away. She died at home on a quiet autumn morning. As usual, Alana prepared breakfast before work and headed to her mother's room. Wake up, Mrs. Mitchell. It's time for breakfast. But this call went unanswered. Her mother lay on her side, covered with a blanket. Alana, not fully comprehending the depth of her sorrow, cried out. Mommy, wake up. You're just sleeping, right? Mrs. Mitchell's hands were still warm, and with tears in her eyes, her daughter clung to them. Life was slowly leaving the tormented woman's body, and Alana refused to believe that she no longer had her mother. This was the second irreplaceable loss in her life. Her brother and sister arrived only on the day of the funeral. They were constantly together, whispering about something, but Alana had no time to observe her relatives. She put in a lot of effort to give her mother a dignified farewell. Thanks to the kindness of strangers, substantial help was provided in organizing the funeral. Some lent money, while others took care of the memorial service. Many kind words were spoken in favor of the bereaved girl. Alana, stay strong. Time heals all wounds, and this pain will subside. Remember that you are not alone in this world, and you can always reach out. We'll help however we can. Alana wished to hear such words of support from her closest people, her sister and brother. However, they were guests at the funeral ceremony and didn't even bother to buy flowers to place on their mother's grave. Julie, Alana's sister, lowered her eyes and tried to explain this oversight. You understand, Alana, the journey was long, and plane tickets aren't cheap at all. My husband only gave me a small amount of money, barely enough for the trip. Julie was seven years younger than her older sister but had already been married twice. Her first marriage lasted only a year, and she hurried to divorce her student husband, who couldn't meet the minimum needs of a young wife. Just a few months after the divorce, Julie married her boss. 
she proudly told her older sister that the man had left his wife and child for her. Alana was horrified by this revelation. Julie. You should know that you can't build your own happiness on someone else's misfortune. The younger sister frowned in displeasure. And you, too. I'm already tired of this saying. The women at work keep buzzing about it. Now the older sister is lecturing me. Well, you did take the child's father away. Doesn't that bother you at all? Julie looked arrogantly at Alana. Imagine, it doesn't. I can give my husband a bunch of children if I want, and I think, sister, you're just jealous. After all, you're almost 30 soon, and you're still alone. This conversation took place shortly before their mother's death. Alana had the urge to give her younger sister a piece of her mind, but she restrained herself. Later, the resentment towards Julie subsided, and she was genuinely glad that her sister had come for the funeral. However, when her sister confessed to her financial troubles, Alana didn't hesitate to reach into her wallet. She gathered the remaining money and handed it to her sister. Julie, I've already spent a lot of money, there's not much left. I think it should be enough for your trip back. Her sister counted the money and didn't even thank Alana. After the memorial service, when everyone dispersed, Julie began from a distance. Sis, forgive Larry and me for bringing up this unpleasant conversation at such a moment, but we need to clarify some details before we leave. At that moment, Alana was washing dishes. Her younger sister's words made her wary. She turned off the water and looked at her brother, who was sitting at the table with an absent expression. It was easy to guess what the conversation would be about, but Alana deliberately delayed that moment. We rarely see each other lately. Mom often mentioned you. She was always waiting for your visit. Julie snorted. Alana, your story sounds like a fantasy. Our mom didn't leave the hospital. Could she remember anything or anyone? By the way, my husband still doesn't know about my mother's mental issues. I'm afraid if he finds out, he'll throw me out on the street. He's passionate about genetics. Larry finally spoke up from his corner. Girls, stop arguing. Let's quickly discuss the main issue and then go our separate ways. Alana asked with a smirk. Are you here to divide the inheritance? Can't wait? Julie glared angrily, and Larry blushed to the depths of his soul. Alana. You can think whatever you want. It's your right. But this issue naturally arises. After all, we all had a share in the apartment and Julie and I have every right to our portion. And how much do you want for your share? If I understand correctly, you don't plan to live here? Julie nodded and stated the amount, then added. If you don't have the money, we can sell the apartment and split the proceeds evenly. Alana, somewhat sarcastically, asked. Aren't you feeling queasy, sis? You just showed up and demand your share when our mother's body isn't even cold. You didn't lift a finger to help me. Larry, who had already recovered, spoke with a mentor's tone. But there's the law, and it provides for it. I know the laws as well as you do. We'll settle this in six months, and for now, both of you can leave. The brother and sister were taken aback by such pressure. They lingered a bit in the kitchen and then headed to the train station without saying goodbye to their older sister. After their departure, Alana pondered for a long time about what to do, but a colleague at the library offered her some advice. Alana, don't let your relatives manipulate you. I suggest you find a good lawyer and resolve the inheritance issue through the court. Be sure to include all the hospital records where your mother was treated. With proper handling, you can prove that your brother and sister are unworthy heirs. Of course, Alana's conscience prevented her from taking such a step. She had already started looking for profitable options for selling or exchanging the apartment when she met Morty. A young site foreman came to the library and awkwardly asked for help. Please, help me, I'm completely lost. Alana was just sorting the card catalog and the persistent visitor annoyed her. How can I assist you? You see, we have a seminar at work next week and the boss ordered me to prepare a speech. I've never participated in such events before and don't even know where to start. 
I'm not a public person, and I get lost in front of people. The young man suddenly smiled, and dimples appeared on his cheeks. Alana felt ashamed of her unfriendly tone and spoke in a friendlier manner. The only thing I can offer you is newspapers. Every industry has its own publications where you can find useful information. I'm not a specialist in construction, though my mother worked in construction her whole life. The visitor immediately brightened up. Word by word, a connection was established between the young people. On that day, Alana learned about the existence of a construction company. Her new acquaintance, Mr. Stewart, enthusiastically talked about his work. The young man came from a family of builders and was proud to continue his father and grandfather's legacy. However, he had obvious problems with the Russian language, and Alana helped him compose the speech. Mr. Stewart never got to showcase his speaking skills. The boss took the prepared text from him and patted him on the shoulder. Thanks, Morty. I won't forget your help. The young foreman was shocked and intended to assert his rights. Mr. Brown, but this is unfair. I spent half a day in the library, and even the lady helped me compose the speech. The boss patted him on the shoulder again, but harder this time. See what a lucky task I assigned you. So, you should thank me even more. I'm taking the text, and I wish you to continue getting to know the lady, and don't be mad at me. Your moment of glory is still ahead because you're young, and my time is strictly limited. Morty had no choice but to agree with the boss. He didn't want to argue with the management, especially since troubled times had come, and those who expressed dissatisfaction could quickly be put on the street. For this reason, most employees remained silent, hiding flaws and even serious violations of construction standards. Of course, Morty didn't tell his future wife about his professional problems, and Alana immediately felt that Morty was her destiny. They had been dating for only a month and a half when they filed for registration. Before the registration, Morty moved into his future wife's apartment. Amid the hustle and bustle, Alana completely forgot about her sister and brother. However, Julie remembered her inheritance and had no intention of giving up her share to anyone. She showed up just on the day when the newlyweds signed their marriage certificate. The newlyweds decided to celebrate the significant event with a small dinner for two when the phone rang at the most crucial moment. Alana rushed to the hallway. Maybe it's our neighbor coming to congratulate us. But on the doorstep stood Julie. She wore an expensive fur coat and a matching fur hat. Without waiting for an invitation, she walked into the kitchen. Oh, it seems there's a celebration going on here. I wonder what's the occasion. The last thing Alana wanted on this solemn day was to see her sister. She replied very dryly. This doesn't concern you. Why did you come? Julie whistled. Wow, look at you talking. She went to the table and poured herself some champagne. Julie didn't like the drink and grimaced. How can you even drink this? But the low-quality drink still had an effect on the young woman, and after a small amount of the bubbly beverage, the younger sister noticed that, apart from herself and Alana, there was one more person in the kitchen. She pointed at Morty with her finger. Alana, who's this guy? Are you friends with him? Alana had no intention of tolerating her sister's impertinence. She took the bottle from the guest's hands and said loudly. This is my husband. You could have informed us of your visit. Julie stared at Morty once again. Little sister, does your husband know that this apartment isn't solely your property? Morty decided to give his relative a lesson in politeness. I feel compelled to remind you, Julie, that discussing someone in their presence is highly impolite. Such behavior is considered uncouth. Julie made a face. What? Have you picked up some fancy words somewhere? Let me put it simply. I won't give up what's mine, and I don't care what you think of me. Alana noticed that her sister was in a combative mood. She was ready for a quarrel, but Morty unexpectedly said to the sisters. I think we can settle the apartment issue. I have the money, and you, Julie, will receive your share, so to speak, in cash. Tomorrow, we'll go to the notary together. Julie shrugged. Why? Just give me the money. No, that won't work. 
At the notary, we'll draw up all the necessary documents, and you'll sign them. I don't want to do it that way. Morty carefully examined his wife's sister. We can also settle the inheritance issue through the court. But I don't think you'll like that option any better. Julie was puzzled. Can't we do this without all this hassle? Just give me what's due to me, and I'll leave you alone. Alana decided to put an end to this unpleasant conversation. No, little sister. It won't work your way. In a month or a year, you'll get it into your head that the division was unfair, and you'll start bothering us again. Julie had nothing to say against such an argument. She reluctantly said. Fine, let it be your way. Can I stay at your place tonight? What a silly question. Of course, you can stay. You can even be our guest as long as you want. This response from her sister subdued the obstinate Julie, and she didn't refuse dinner, tea, and cake. The next morning, the sisters went to the notary. However, it turned out that to finally resolve the inheritance issue, the presence of the younger brother was required. So, Julie left empty-handed. On the day appointed by the lawyer, the sisters went to the notary again, this time with Larry. The brother immediately renounced his claims to his share in favor of the older sister. He explained his decision like this. Julie confused me. It was an awkward situation back then. I want to apologize to you, sister. You took care of us, like a mother, after all. And I acted like a total jerk. Forgive me. Alana was moved by her brother's confession. Julie, on the other hand, saw his action as a personal vendetta. Without holding back, she attacked the young man. Larry, you were impaired in childhood, and you remain that way. Who gave you permission to spill everything? You could have, for example, renounced your share in my favor. I'll never forgive you for this. So, the sister and brother parted as enemies. But after all the paperwork was done, the apartment issue was finally resolved. Later, the spouses privatized the property to avoid any future conflicts. The family life of the Smiths flowed peacefully, overcoming everyday troubles. They had enough money not only for a comfortable life but also for an annual vacation. Mr. Stewart was appointed the head of his department and began to consider starting his own business. He shared his plans with his wife one day. Alana, I haven't told anyone else yet. You're the first. I'm tired of depending on others. I want to work for myself. The young woman always supported her husband, but this time, she felt an unfamiliar anxiety. Morty, you know better than me that the construction business is the most challenging and dangerous field. Her husband laughed. You've been reading too many detective stories in your library. Many of my friends have successfully ventured into this business. One of my university classmates opened an office abroad. The key is to do everything within the law, and there won't be any trouble. Mr. Stewart was inspired by this new idea, and he began to spend less time at home. Mrs. Smith didn't complain about fate and told her little daughter. Your daddy will soon earn even more money, and we'll all go on a trip together. The couple had long dreamed of visiting the most interesting places on the planet, and they wanted to spend their next vacation in Thailand. However, these plans were not meant to be. One chilly December day, a tragedy struck. Mr. Stewart and several other workers were crushed at the construction site when a concrete slab fell from a crane. His wife was only informed of the incident the next morning. Mrs. Smith hadn't closed her eyes all night. She waited for her husband. When the phone finally rang, she immediately sensed that a new misfortune had come to their house. The management of the construction company tried to downplay the accident and shifted all the blame onto the victims themselves. The company's director, sweating with nervousness, even told the widow of the head of the department. It's directly your husband's fault. He was responsible for the technical condition of the crane and other equipment. Mrs. Smith quietly corrected the man. He was responsible. The director turned even redder. What? What did you say? The woman replied just as calmly. I was just correcting you. You used the present tense, but we should be talking about those who have passed away in the past. 
My husband is no longer responsible for the mess in your unprofessional company. The director was left speechless. She walked out of the office, carefully closing the door behind her. That tragedy claimed the lives of four young, healthy men. Only two people survived, but they remained disabled for life. The unfortunate widows, who lost their breadwinners in a single day, hoped to receive some form of compensation. But the management not only refused the women but also treated them rudely. After a brief conversation with the director of the company, Mrs. Smith felt intense shame. She fled from the office, where she had been smeared with mud, and saw nothing in front of her. There was only one desire, to get away from this place and forever forget about the existence of this construction company. In the young woman's mind, everything was jumbled, and she couldn't see anything in front of her. Mrs. Smith had almost reached the middle of the road when someone's firm hand grabbed her, and a shrill female voice screamed right in her ear. Fool, are you trying to get yourself killed? Don't you want to live? This shout had the effect of a bucket of ice water. Alana snapped back to reality, trembling with fear. She looked at the woman who had saved her from certain death with gratitude. Since that memorable day, they were practically inseparable from Mrs. Morgan. Mrs. Morgan had her own tragedy in life. Her husband died just a month after their wedding. She never told anyone the details of that unfortunate incident, not even Alana. When asked, she wisely replied. Alana, you have your own share of troubles. Why burden yourself with mine? Believe me, it's all in the past now. Maybe I regret something now, but it's too late to change anything. Only years later did Mrs. Smith realize that her friend regretted not allowing herself to be happy. As Mrs. Morgan confessed, she was afraid of a repeat of misfortune and rejected all the men who offered her their hand and heart. This self-imposed loneliness ultimately caused men to stop paying attention to her. This late May day was particularly hot. The sun had been scorching since early morning, and Mrs. Smith felt significant discomfort, not only from the unusual heat but also from excessive anxiety. To collect her thoughts, she decided to take a few deep breaths. Not far from the entrance to the building housing the main office of the construction company, she noticed an empty bench. For the first few minutes, her heart raced frantically, but then she began to calm down. Nearly 20 years had passed since the tragic death of her husband, or at least Mrs. Smith struggled to recognize the building that had induced panic in her for so many years. Now, she looked at this object without any unpleasant emotions. Both the appearance of the building and the surrounding landscape had changed. A motivating thought crossed her mind. Well, are you just going to sit there? Since you came here, take action. Just in case, the woman took a compact mirror from her purse and critically inspected her reflection. Not bad, even for a cleaner. After her conversation with Vanessa, Alana began to pay more attention to her appearance. Especially, the words about the company owner, whom she knew as Mr. Scott, carefully selecting the staff stuck with her. However, the candidate for the vacant assistant position she met was no longer young but a very polite lady. She offered the visitor a chair and introduced herself briefly. Mrs. Turner. I won't bother mentioning my last name because you won't remember it anyway. I'm currently filling the secretary's role and, by extension, handling HR matters in the absence of the boss. Since the boss is temporarily unavailable, I'll be making all the decisions on his behalf. Mrs. Smith was taken aback and simply said ambiguously. Oh. Mrs. Turner smiled. You know, I sometimes surprise myself. But modern life is such that if you lag behind even a little, you're forever left behind. I really wouldn't want that. Ardiakova couldn't help but say. Me neither. It's nice to find mutual understanding right from the start. I hope our acquaintance with you will continue in such a positive way. So, I'm listening to you attentively, madam. Mrs. Smith introduced herself and explained the purpose of her visit. Mrs. Turner listened attentively, but for some reason, she asked. Are you an educator by training? No, I graduated from a library university. However, that was a long time ago. Does my former profession matter? The assistant smiled again. Yes, don't worry, Mrs. Smith. You have excellent speech. 
That's why I asked you such an unconventional question. I used to be a Russian language and literature teacher myself. But in the late 90s, I ended up outside of that field. I spent a long time searching for my new place in life, but the world is not without kind people. Our boss's father helped me out of a dire situation, and now I can't imagine my life without this job. Mrs. Smith was surprised by such frankness and understood that her interlocutor expected a similar step from her. She told Mrs. Turner about the main points of her biography and concluded by saying, I just can't afford to relax right now. Maybe later, I'll want to enjoy my retirement like normal pensioners, but not now. Mrs. Turner theatrically rolled her eyes and said, Oh, our children. We're ready to do anything for their well-being. I have a situation that's almost identical. The difference is, I don't allow my children to lean on me. I've politely distanced them from myself. My daughter and son have a year's difference in age. They live independently and manage just fine, which I'm very glad about. But I always keep an eye on their affairs to be able to lend them my strong shoulder when needed. Mrs. Turner had a delicate build, so expressive epithets didn't quite suit her appearance. She laughed heartily at her own joke, saying, I guess I distract you too much. But in this office, among rough men, it can sometimes get unbearably dull, and you want to exchange a few words with someone. Her pleasant face suddenly became serious as she said, so, let's get down to business. If I understood you correctly, you don't mind working as a cleaner, do you? Mrs. Smith straightened up like a string and replied, I really need a job. At my previous job, the owner has already warned me about being fired. The HR department head interrupted the woman, asking, I'm sorry, but where did you work? At the everything for the home store. I still work there. Mrs. Turner's face lit up with a smile once again. I know Mrs. Adams very well. You could say we're friends. By the way, her son Bevis used to be in my class. He was such a smart boy. He used to write very beautiful essays. Mrs. Smith understood that it was best not to dwell on her employer's problems. She and the HR assistant chatted a bit more on unrelated topics, and then Mrs. Turner handed her a clean sheet of paper and a pen. Well, Mrs. Smith, go ahead and write your application. Try to start fresh. Mrs. Smith quickly completed the task. Mrs. Turner listed the cleaning duties for her, saying, the main requirement is not to be seen by the boss. To meet this condition, you'll have to come to work early, before the office staff takes their places. Alternatively, you can do the cleaning later when everyone has gone home. Choose whichever suits you best, but I need a clear schedule on my desk. We have very strict discipline here. Mrs. Smith couldn't believe her luck. She agreed to everything the assistant to the company's director said. Mrs. Turner escorted the new employee to the elevator. Oh, I almost forgot to tell you, she said. Our Mr. Scott is extremely meticulous. God forbid if something is out of place, where it shouldn't be. Since you'll be responsible for maintaining order in his office as well, make sure you keep this in mind. I find you very likable, and I rarely make mistakes in people. Mrs. Smith returned home in a lifted mood. She felt as though an unbearable burden had been lifted from her shoulders, making it easier to breathe. Her daughter noticed these changes and asked with concern, A mom. What's going on with you today? You're not yourself. Mrs. Smith changed from stylish high-heeled shoes to indoor slippers and replied, Darling, from today onwards, I'm starting a new chapter in my life. Gloria squealed with joy. Mom, you're super. Mrs. Smith gently embraced her daughter and planted a kiss on her nose. I know everything, my joy, but the grace period is over, and I no longer have any bonuses in my pocket. You have a husband. Let him make a little effort. After all, your Justin has parents, and they're not destitute. Let them help you a bit. I can't do it all on my own. Sniffles were heard. These sounds indicated that the daughter had resorted to her most effective means of influencing her mother. Mommy, mommy. This is so cruel of you. We just need a little time to prepare. The positive mood, like an ethereal substance, slowly began to dissipate, giving way to the familiar fatigue. 
Mrs. Smith pushed away the gloomy despondency with an act of will and said rather abruptly. Glory, enough of your complaining. You and Justin had a whole six years to prepare, but you were busy with entirely different things. Did you think I would obediently carry this burden forever? No, my dear. End this comedy. I think the phrase is familiar to you, and you don't need a translation. But out of purely human motives, I'll give you exactly one month. A look of horror froze in her daughter's eyes. Mrs. Smith hesitated for a moment but then recalled Mrs. Turner's words and said to her daughter quite harshly. Glory, no need for theatrics. Today, it doesn't matter if you succeed or not. I'll give you some sound advice as a woman. Give your husband a good push or start looking for another life partner. A real man should provide for his family, not live off of me. And why are you so upset? I'm not kicking you out onto the street. Live your life, but pay for all your pleasures yourselves. Mrs. Smith admired her own courage. If she had a tambourine in her hands right now, she would have beaten it with all her might. Glory stood frozen in place, looking hopefully at her mother. Mama, what about Willie? Glory, is this another attempt to press on a sore spot? You're wasting your effort. Because this trick doesn't work on me anymore, and besides, I'm not giving up my duties as a grandmother. Everything stays the same, except for the change in your status from idlers to people with jobs. Do I make myself clear? Glory grumbled, clear as day. Mrs. Smith headed to her room to rest after a taxing day. Gloria stood in the middle of the kitchen for a long time, lost in thought. She tried to figure out what her mother's ultimatum would lead to. Thoughts swirled in her mind, but at one of the turns, one thought derailed from its orbit. Gloria, you'll have to cook dinner yourself today, and then you'll need to do Willie's laundry and take him for a walk. The young woman headed to the sink, muttering to herself, oh, God, how awful. I can't stand this. This day also became a turning point for Gloria and her family. In the evening, while Justin was in his usual amorphous state, his wife expressed a series of complaints to him. Amidst the flow of beautiful and not very ethical words, the young man understood that the period of idleness was over for him. For the first time in years of married life, Justin didn't sleep at night. He tried to resolve the dilemma. Should he accept his wife's conditions and start looking for a job tomorrow, or should he find another, more compliant life partner? He dismissed the second option immediately. He realized that he loved his wife. Perhaps his love wasn't like everyone else's, but he definitely loved Gloria and Willie. The man resignedly whispered to himself, I'll have to find a job. This was his last coherent thought before Justin slipped into a sweet slumber. Summer had passed unnoticed, and the first signs of autumn were in the air, the scent of fallen leaves and increased humidity. However, Mrs. Smith didn't notice these changes because her life had returned to a normal course. She quickly settled into her new job and alternated between morning and evening shifts after a week. Mrs. Turner approved of this schedule. You're doing great. You've chosen a rational solution for yourself, and it's convenient for me to coordinate the office work. By the way, Mr. Scott immediately noticed that his office was cleaner. He even asked me to thank you on his behalf, which I'm happy to do. The first praise uplifted the woman, and she shared her joy with her friend. Mrs. Morgan wisely remarked, see how well I got you a job. Just don't celebrate prematurely. Mr. Scott is a bit unpredictable. You never know what will cross his mind tomorrow. Things started moving forward, even in the seemingly hopeless situation at home. The occupants, as Mrs. Smith referred to her daughter and son-in-law, shed their cocoons. For a couple of weeks, they didn't speak to her, expressing their dissatisfaction in this way. But then, the silent treatment got old. One evening, the son-in-law met her in the hallway. Mrs. Smith, I want to let you know that I've found a job. They promised to give me a small advance. Very good, Justin. The woman thought that words of approval would never be superfluous. Let Justin know that she is not his enemy and rejoices in his successes. Mrs. Smith thought about all the recent events and the seasons while relaxing in the yard near the playground. Suddenly, she caught herself thinking more and more often lately that youth, too, flies by in the blink of an eye. 
you don't even have time to look around, and old age is already at the doorstep. The woman tried to switch from these gloomy thoughts to more pleasant ones, and the main stimulus in her current life was her grandson Willie, who was playing in the sandbox with other children. When she saw this happy scene, she felt a surge of energy. She called out to her grandson loudly. Willie, don't get dirty. Have you forgotten that we were going to the park together? The boy quickly jumped out of the sandbox and at first wanted to wipe his hands on his jeans, but then changed his mind. Grandma, but my hands are dirty. Can you appear in the park like this? Everyone will say I'm a dirty boy. Mrs. Smith reassured the boy. This is a fixable matter. We'll clean up right now. She took out wet wipes from her purse. Give me your little hands. Grandma will clean your palms and fingers well. We wouldn't want to go back home just because of this little thing, would we? The chubby lips of the boy stretched into a contented smile. No, let's go to the fountain instead, and I can wash everything there. Willie, if everyone starts washing their hands and feet in the fountain, it will be complete chaos. Like at daddy's work? The woman's hand, along with the wipe, froze in the air. Did your dad say that? Yes. He also said that this job is terrible, and he's not a slave on a plantation to bend his back for little money. Mrs. Smith decided that it wasn't worth questioning her grandson any further. However, in her plan, which she always kept in mind, she noted that she needed to do some educational work with Willie's parents. The woman thought. Can we discuss such matters in front of a child and then be surprised at where kids pick up such words? Willie looked at his grandmother expectantly because his hands were still covered in sand. Mrs. Smith suddenly realized. Willie, you've completely covered my head with your fountain. After a thorough hygiene procedure, grandmother and grandson headed to the park. A massive reconstruction had recently been carried out in this favorite relaxation spot for the townsfolk, making the park even more attractive. To enrich the playground, the administration decided to install slides, swings, and a miniature fairy tale city. Older kids could practice their climbing skills on the climbing wall or compete in races between scooter riders or skateboarders. From an early age, Willie was an active child, drawn to mobile forms of entertainment. Mrs. Smith wasn't surprised when her grandson dragged her to the far corner of the park. Grandma, let's go there first, and then you can buy me ice cream. All right, Willie. Today, I'll grant any of your wishes, but don't stray too far from me. The boy agreed to everything as long as he could watch the skillful boys racing down and up on their skateboards at cosmic speed. Willie was not alone in his desire, as a dozen or so spectators of various ages had gathered near a low fence, driven by universal interest. Encouraged by the audience, the athletes decided to show off their best tricks to the public. Willie quickly found a playmate of about the same age with long hair. The boy's unusual hairstyle made him look like a little prince or even his majesty. Mrs. Smith involuntarily admired the child for a few seconds and got distracted from reality. During those moments, something happened that caused all the spectators to scatter. Only the boy with the prince-like appearance remained in place, while Willie ran away. All of this happened in a matter of seconds. Out of the corner of her eye, Mrs. Smith noticed a young skateboarder heading toward the child. Apparently, the boy misjudged his speed and went off track. Of course, Mrs. Smith didn't know the intricacies of this extreme sport, she only understood one thing, an unknown danger was approaching the boy. Forgetting about her age and her aching lower back, the woman positioned her body in the path of the flying projectile. Although the impact was quite strong, Mrs. Smith managed to stay on her feet. She held the crying child close to her, and Willie asked with a concerned voice. Grandma, are you hurt badly? It took her a moment to understand what her grandson was asking. She replied as calmly as she could. I'm not hurt at all. Her grandson, overwhelmed with excitement, began to tell her what he had seen from the sidelines. He was going so fast. I'll tell daddy everything when we get home. You're our real savior, just like in the cartoons. Someone behind her touched Mrs. Smith's shoulder. Are you okay, ma'am? If it weren't for you, those boys would have been seriously hurt. Stunts like that should only be performed behind a safety net. 
The culprit of the incident with his mode of transportation had disappeared behind the trees, but the unfamiliar boy was still clinging to Mrs. Smith. She asked him. Who did you come here with? Although the initial fright had passed, the child's voice still trembled. With my mom. And where is your mom? The boy tugged at the woman's arm. There's my mom. She's on her phone again. Grandpa has told her a million times that she won't notice anything until she loses her head, but mom never listens. Not even to grandpa. From the tone, it was easy to tell that the child was clearly mimicking someone. The young mother continued to talk on her mobile phone, only briefly diverting her attention to her son. Carl. Where are you wandering off to? I told you to stay close. Mrs. Smith was appalled by the indifference of the young mother. Mom, your child was in danger just a few minutes ago, and you're casually chatting on the phone. The woman said into her phone disapprovingly. Lindsay, I'm sorry, but I have to hang up. Some crazy lady just confronted me. I'll call you back later. After disconnecting her mobile phone, the mother grabbed her child's hand with such force that the little one cried out in pain. She dragged him away. I'll teach you at home how not to listen to your mom. The last thing I need is some nosy lady telling me how to deal with you. You'll be punished for your disobedience. Mrs. Smith watched the pair walk away and noticed that she still had the rescued child's hat in her hand. She shouted. Wait, mom. You forgot something. The young woman stopped but didn't take a step forward. Mrs. Smith covered the short distance and handed the child's headgear to the mother. The culprit of the incident took advantage of the moment and wriggled out of his mother's grasp. He took something bright out of his pocket and extended it to his savior. My name is Carl, and this is my lucky horse Conan. Grandpa says it brings luck. Willie pulled his grandmother's hand. You promised to buy me ice cream. Mrs. Smith absentmindedly placed the boy's gift in her purse. Willie, you're so impatient. That's not how it works. The boy retorted. I'm little. I can do it. When I grow up and become like dad, then I won't be able to indulge like this. I probably won't be able to have ice cream either. Good spirits returned to the elderly woman, and she reassured her grandson. You can enjoy ice cream at any age. Even generals are allowed to eat ice cream. The boy let out a triumphant shout and rushed to the ice cream vendor. Exhausted from the adventure and filled with impressions, they returned home in the evening. Willie was eager to share the story of his grandmother rescuing his new friend with his parents. He accompanied his narrative with gestures and loud sounds. Gloria waited for her son to finish and then addressed her mother. Mom, did you really have to get involved? I'm amazed you didn't get hurt yourself. Mrs. Smith rubbed her back. I think there will be some bruises after all. That thing hit me quite hard on the back. It's a good thing the boy on the skateboard jumped off before colliding with me. Justin stared at Mrs. Smith for a long moment, then sarcastically remarked. We still have heroes around, huh? Our brave women are ready to catch skateboards in midair. Bravo, Mrs. Smith. Her son-in-law's speech was accompanied by applause. She understood that Justin couldn't let it go, but she didn't have the energy to respond to his teasing. Most of all, Mrs. Smith wanted to lie down and stretch her legs. She had already settled into bed and was getting ready to sleep when she suddenly remembered the little Carl's gift. Retrieving the present from her purse, the woman was surprised. This can't be. No. It must be my imagination. Sleepiness vanished as if by magic, and her vision became hazy, as if she had entered a fog. The first thing from the past that rushed into her mind was a song, similar to a counting rhyme. Her mother used to sing such an unusual lullaby to the younger children. She sat there, clutching an old toy in her hands. It seemed to her that time had frozen with a dark shadow on the windowsill. An unpleasant nausea crept up her throat with every breath, and to get rid of this uncomfortable feeling, she opened the window. The cold, autumn wind rushed into the room, but it cooled her overheated imagination. Is it my imagination, or am I really going crazy? Mrs. Smith remembered her mother, who had passed away so early, and whispered. 
How could this toy have ended up with that boy? Maybe it's a copy? She examined the wooden whistle, shaped like a horse, with great fascination. No, it's not a copy. It's the same horse that. The wheel of time suddenly turned backward, and Mrs. Smith found herself back in the company town where her childhood had flown by. The main attraction of their little place was Grandpa Ralph. No one knew his last name, but legends circulated about his heroic past. Some even claimed that Ralph had been a partisan commander and was awarded the hero's star. However, no one had ever seen this award either. The old man had quirks and led a solitary life. Every day, he went for a walk with a pink piglet. The piglet had a dog leash around its neck, and Ralph gave it commands, entertaining the people. Patty. Stand on your hind legs. And how do you ask for food? Now, my boy, say hello to everyone. Surprisingly, the piglet obeyed all of its owner's commands. Ralph only put on these shows on special occasions. After showcasing his pet skills, he would head to the pub, where he stayed until closing time. Often, after drinking, the old man would start a minor brawl, but the law enforcement officers never arrested him, they pitted him. It's nothing, let the old man have some fun. He's earned it. After all, he doesn't harm anyone. Indeed, Ralph was very kind and generous. Whenever he received his pension, he would buy candies and distribute them to the children. But another peculiarity of the old man was his unusual craft. He made toys out of various scraps and also gave them to the children. Alana, along with her friends, often visited Grandpa Ralph. During those years, it was quite popular for students to help lonely people with their household chores. One day, their schoolteacher asked them. Girls, do you know Grandpa Ralph? The schoolgirls replied together. We know him, Mrs. Russell. And do you know that this man has received awards because he performed many heroic deeds during the war years? Once again, the children responded positively, and the teacher got to the point. This man is very lonely. And you, as young heroes, can help him. The girls didn't let the teacher finish and, interrupting each other, began offering various ways to help. Some promised to clean the floors in Ralph's house, while others wanted to cook soup for the hero. The teacher approved both options but warned her students. Girls, no acting on your own. If Grandpa refuses to accept you today, arrange another day with him. Ask when it's convenient for him. As a team, the girls went to visit the hero and his trained piglet. Ralph warmly greeted the enthusiastic group of schoolchildren and invited them into his home. As soon as the girls crossed the threshold of the modest dwelling, they froze with amazement. Toys were everywhere, bright, incredibly cheerful toys. They were neatly arranged on the shelves of a bookcase, and some hung from the ceiling on strings. The schoolgirls instantly forgot the purpose of their visit and began to examine the toys with delight. Of course, the guests bombarded the master with questions. Grandpa Ralph. What do you make these toys from? The old man was embarrassed by the attention, so he answered briefly. From various pieces of wood. There's a lot of junk in the woods. I pick it up. The main thing in this craft is to see something different in a piece of firewood. For example, this rooster. I carved it from a gnarl I found in a ravine behind the old stable, and this dog is made from branches. The first tour left a lasting impression on Alana. Her impressions overwhelmed her, and she decided to tell her mother about the visit to the hero. However, Mrs. Mitchell shouted at her daughter. Don't you dare go there anymore. Grandpa has not been all right in the head for a long time. He might get some crazy idea, and your teacher is completely out of her mind. Can you send children to a crazy old man? I'll go see the school director. Mrs. Mitchell didn't say what she would do to the teacher when she visited the school director. But Alana knew that her mother didn't waste her words. She was very afraid that her mother would eventually keep her promise. However, Mrs. Mitchell was busy with household chores. Her younger brother Conan had recently been born, and a month later, their father left home. The woman silently endured this grief because she had to support four children on her own. Therefore, she had no time for sentimentality. 
If there was anything left over from her, it was mostly reprimands for Alana. To avoid angering her mother, she decided not to bring up the topic of Grandpa Ralph anymore, but secretly continued to visit him. Alana really wanted to learn how to make toys just like his. Of all the girls, she turned out to be the most diligent student. Ralph taught her to make a rooster and a hen, but Alana couldn't take her eyes off a small horse-shaped whistle that you could blow into. The old man made this toy with her around and blew into the drilled hole. Look what fun it turned out to be. Maybe I should give it to the police department staff? They don't have enough whistles. Alana decided to speak up. Grandpa Ralph. Please give me the little horse. I have a little brother, and I haven't given him anything. There are plenty of toys in the store. Buy whatever you want. A car, a whole train set if you like. We don't have money for toys. Dad left us, and Mom has to work a lot to feed four of us. I even had to go to school this year in my old uniform, and everyone makes fun of me. That's a real tragedy. All right, Alana, take this horse for your Conan. Just make sure the little one doesn't accidentally swallow the toy. The girl hugged the gift to her chest and ran home. Her homemade toy immediately appealed to her younger brother. Conan squealed with delight and even tried to put the wooden horse in his mouth. However, Mrs. Mitchell did not share the children's joy. Her face was darker than a storm cloud, and she glared at her daughter. You didn't listen to me after all. You went to Ralph. Alana didn't try to justify herself, instead, she looked her mother directly in the eye and said confidently. He is good, and everything they say about him is a lie. Unexpectedly, her mother laughed. Look at you, trying to defend him. Well, tomorrow you will go to grandpa's and bring him some pancakes. I'll be baking today. Alana was surprised and asked. Why? Because when someone does you a good turn, you should return it in kind. The old man is lonely, and no one cooks for him. The next day, Alana brought Ralph a treat, and in return, she received another toy. A genuine friendship blossomed between the old man and the girl. However, these warm relationships were short-lived. One day, during a visit, Alana found Ralph in tears. When she asked what had happened, he bitterly replied. My Patty is gone. They stole him. Just thinking about what they'll do to him breaks my heart. Alana was afraid to even think about the fate that awaited the piglet. Without much thought, she organized a search party with her friends to find the missing animal. The schoolgirls searched the entire village, but no one had seen the trained piglet. The old man's sorrow was so overwhelming that he gave up his craft. He no longer welcomed guests into his home. As spring approached, the news spread through the village that Ralph had passed away. The whole village attended the hero's funeral. In the procession, police officers in their dress uniforms carried orders and medals, with a golden star standing out among the awards. Many village children still had toys made by the old craftsmen. After Patty disappeared, the old man gave away all his roosters and kittens to the children. Conan never parted with his little horse, even as he grew a little older. He was only two years old when he learned to blow into the whistle. The sound signal amazed the boy the most. He often held concerts at home for his sisters and brother. Mrs. Mitchell didn't interfere with the young talent, instead, she watched her youngest son with tears in her eyes and said. He's just like his father. Such a bright spirit. On the day when Conan went with his mother to the city to see a doctor, he took his beloved little horse with him. However, he disappeared along with the toy. More than 40 years had passed since that day, but Mrs. Smith remembered that fateful day forever. She even recalled that there was a light rain in the morning, and her mother forgot to bring an umbrella. Alana accompanied them to the crossroads and wanted to run home for an umbrella, but Mrs. Mitchell said. Don't bother, dear. Going back is a bad omen. Conan and I are not made of sugar, we won't melt in the rain. The weather cleared up by noon, but Conan's mother returned home alone. Outside, the sky had brightened considerably, but Mrs. Smith sat there, gazing into the misty distance. In her hand, she held a wooden horse of burgundy color. She thought that the color didn't suit such an animal. 
Ralph had also painted the toy in an inappropriate color and explained with a smile. There's a bluebird that grants wishes, and I have a blue horse. I would gladly paint it a different color, but I've run out of paint, only blue is left. Memories of the past briefly calmed and warmed the not-so-young woman's heart. She realized that she had to find the boy Carl and learn from his mother how the unique toy ended up in their hands. Mrs. Morgan had tried various professions in her long life. After school, she immediately enrolled in college to become a sales manager but quickly realized that she couldn't look a customer in the eye and deceive them at the same time. Her fiancé worked as a bus driver and Vanessa also became interested in driving a big vehicle. She even enrolled in courses to learn to drive a trolley bus, but after the tragic death of her young husband, she abandoned this risky venture. Later, Vanessa was introduced to a restaurant job through a friend. During the times of widespread shortages, this was the most coveted profession. Therefore, Mrs. Morgan had big bosses and ordinary housewives as friends. She remained in the restaurant industry until the 1990s when everything went downhill. Like mushrooms sprouting from the ground, bandits emerged, buying everything their eyes fell on. They also bought their restaurant, and immediately, they began reshuffling the staff. Every employee was summoned to the new restaurateur's office and, in just two minutes, had their fate decided. Mrs. Morgan was also asked a few questions. How old are you, dear, and what else can you do besides filling out orders and handling invoices? Vanessa confessed. I can't do anything else. The new restaurateur pointed his finger at the door. I don't need such employees. I'm turning this place into an upscale club. Beautiful girls will perform here. And you don't have the right look. I'm not a potato to have my appearance judged like this. Vanessa slammed the door loudly, openly wishing the new owner a swift bankruptcy. In addition to financial losses, she also wished him to catch a dog's mange. There were other wishes that were not customary to talk about. Mrs. Morgan doesn't know what happened to that scoundrel. But she heard that the restaurant where she worked lost customers and went bankrupt. The safety cushion that Vanessa had built over the years only lasted for a short time. Endless financial reforms caused substantial damage to her financial well-being. There was a period when she felt squeezed and was willing to take any job, and her former connections helped her once again. For a while, Mrs. Morgan worked at the post office in the mail distribution department. Then she completed some courses and went for a promotion. Mrs. Morgan was bid farewell by the entire department when she retired and received many expensive gifts, along with wishes for a happy retirement. The woman enjoyed her new status for a short time, just two days. On the third day, she got bored and called Alana, who still had two more years to go before retirement. Alana, I'm already fed up with it all. I want to work. And Mrs. Morgan's life began to move up vertically. After numerous trials and errors, she finally found her dream job. The nature of the work didn't bother her at all, especially because her salary was deposited directly into her account. She had a lot of free time. On that autumn day, Mrs. Morgan was burning with boredom. She counted the revenue several times, but time still moved very slowly. In her heart, she thought, I wish Alana would call. As soon as she got a new job, she disappeared from my radar. Hardly had she uttered these words when her mobile phone vibrated. Vanessa pressed the green button with her finger. Hello, Mrs. Morgan speaking. In response, she heard her friend's angry voice. Vanessa. Can't you stop fooling around? Aren't you tired yet? Why are you so angry? Did someone step on your tail, or did the new boss shout at you? Vanessa. I'm calling you about a serious matter, and you're joking all the time. Laughter prolongs life. You should know that. Trust me, there's no room for laughter right now, I feel like crying. Go on. What's happened to you again? You're not a woman, you're a walking disaster. That's precisely why I'm calling you. When can I come over? The friends agreed on a meeting time, and Mrs. Smith, with heavy thoughts on her mind, began to tidy up. She remembered Mrs. Turner's instructions and tried not to disrupt the order in the boss's office, whom she had never seen. 
She noticed dust on the shelves with thick document folders and started wiping them carefully. Suddenly, something sharp pricked her hand. The woman noticed a glint of glass between the folders. Her hand reached out to this object, which turned out to be a photo frame. The photo itself was also in its proper place, but as soon as she looked at it, a chill ran down her spine. The photograph was of the boy she had saved from trouble yesterday. The tall gray-haired man who held the child by the hand in the photo seemed strangely familiar to Mrs. Smith. She froze. How long had she been standing like that? She didn't know. She snapped out of her thoughts when she heard footsteps approaching the office. Mrs. Smith swiftly placed the photograph back in its place and started dusting. The door opened, and it was the same man from the photo. He looked at her in surprise, and Alana quickly said. I apologize. I got a bit delayed with the cleaning, I'm leaving now. The man remained silent, nodded his head, and walked to his desk. Mrs. Smith, on unsteady legs, walked toward the door. When she had already grabbed the handle, the boss called out to her. Mrs. Smith, if I'm not mistaken. She stopped, turned around. Yes. I want to warn you that I don't like it when cleaning is done in my presence. Under different circumstances, I would have fired such an employee. But considering that you do your job very well, I can't deny that. I'll forgive you this time. Mrs. Smith nodded, though turmoil brewed inside her because she really wanted to respond to this braggart. I understand. I'm sorry. She quietly closed the door behind her and leaned against it. What is happening? Why is her heart beating so fast? Is it because of the boss's remark? No, not really. It's more because of the boy in the photo. Mrs. Smith understood that they needed to figure out where they got that toy. It couldn't have been a similar toy. No one made such toys. She had no idea how to do it. So, after checking the time, she hurried to pick up the mop. She needed to talk to Vanessa. She always knows what to do, even in the most hopeless situations. In the evening, the two friends sat at the table. Vanessa poured tea and looked attentively at Alana. All right, enough of the suspense. You look like it's the end of the world. Mrs. Smith took a sip of the fragrant beverage and said. Honestly, Vanessa. I don't even understand it myself. It's either the end of the world or the beginning. Mrs. Morgan raised her eyebrows. I assume your tenants have caused some trouble again? Alana waved her hand. If only that were the case. I could handle them myself. No, Vanessa, this is something else entirely, and I'm honestly at a loss. Remember? I told you my brother disappeared. Vanessa even opened her mouth. Of course. How could you forget something like that? But if I'm not mistaken, it's been 30 years. Why are you suddenly thinking about it? It's been 40 years. Conan should be 48 years old now. Well, you see. He's not Conan. Still, it's unclear how this toy ended up with him. What should I do, Vanessa? You've always given me good advice, but now I just don't know what to do. If I go to the boss with questions, I'm afraid I won't get any answers, and I'll end up unemployed. Vanessa drummed her fingers on the table impatiently. Yes, quite the dilemma. Here's the thing, my friend. I suggest waiting a bit and, in the meantime, gather information. Anything you can find out about his family might come in handy. Mrs. Smith stared at her friend in horror. How do I do that? Vanessa impatiently shrugged. Well, I don't know. Just be more attentive to conversations, eavesdrop if you have to, keep an eye out. You'll need to look on the internet. Oh, God. How do I even do that? Vanessa took it upon herself. I'll handle it. Seeing her friend's bewildered look, she laughed. Yes, don't worry. I'm not that clueless with the internet either. The thing is, there's a small square next to us. Young people often gather there, all tech-savvy, discussing internet games and stuff. They're always short on money but need to use the restroom. 
apparently, not entirely lost causes since they don't litter in the park. They come asking to use my restroom. I let them, but only when the boss is not around. So, I'll ask them to search everything about him on the internet. As Mrs. Smith was leaving, Vanessa lowered her voice and said. Let's meet exactly a week from now in the same place. Mrs. Smith almost swung at her friend. Come on, Vanessa. No seriousness at all. If you only knew how difficult this is for me right now. Vanessa immediately became serious. Alana. Don't be upset. I see it all. I'm just trying to lift your spirits a little. As soon as Alana entered the apartment, her son-in-law and daughter immediately came up to her. They crossed their arms over their chests and stared at her in silence. Alana understood that another unpleasant conversation was about to take place, and she even had a thought that if it weren't for Willie, she would probably have asked them to move out already. She didn't wait for her tenants to start, she began on her own. Well, what happened this time while I was away? I hope you didn't forget to pick up the child from daycare? Gloria exchanged an exasperated look with her husband and started talking. It's us, mom, who would like to know what's going on with you. You're never at home anymore. You finish work and then disappear somewhere, and today we even had movie tickets, by the way. Mrs. Smith shrugged. Well, no one told me about the movie. Mom, you're elderly. It's perfectly natural that you should go home after work. Why should we warn you? Gloria's voice was getting louder, and her husband nodded in agreement with her words. Alana looked at him, then stopped her gaze on her daughter. First of all, I don't owe anyone anything. Secondly, just because I'm elderly, it doesn't mean I can't have things to do. And thirdly, I'm very tired. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll go lie down. She brushed past her daughter and son-in-law, who were left speechless, and went into her room. She closed the door tightly behind her and sat down on the bed. She took out her toy horse and sat there, holding it in her palm. Her memory faithfully replayed scenes from the past, and large tears rolled down Mrs. Smith's cheeks. She thought she wouldn't last a week, but Mr. Scott had gone on a business trip, so even if Mrs. Smith had decided to talk to him, she wouldn't have caught him. However, his absence had a positive effect on Alana's colleagues. They became more relaxed. The first person Alana started to inquire about was Mrs. Turner. They bumped into each other in the corridor just a day after Mr. Scott's departure. Mrs. Smith, how glad I am to see you. I've been coming here purely and even forgot when I last saw you. Mrs. Smith was a little embarrassed. I try not to show up unnecessarily. You know, away from the boss. Mrs. Turner laughed. But I'm not the boss. You don't have to hide from me. Do you know, Mrs. Smith? I can see that you've already finished your work. Come to my office. Let's have some tea, chat. You can tell me about your relatives. Mrs. Smith wanted to decline right away, but then she stopped herself. Mrs. Turner had known Mr. Scott for a long time. Perhaps she could share something interesting. Thank you. I'd be happy to accept your invitation. I'll just put everything away. Yes, I'll change clothes too. Excellent. I'll be waiting for you. During their leisurely conversation, Mrs. Smith learned that Mr. Scott had recently moved here with his family from a distant city in Alaska. She also heard that Mr. Scott's son got married here, and his daughter-in-law was not exactly to his liking. Alana wasn't particularly thrilled with this information. She had already guessed that the daughter-in-law wasn't the best, but who was she to judge? Nowadays, all young people are like that. Just take her daughter, for example. During the entire week, Alana didn't learn anything more. On the weekend, Alana started getting ready early in the morning. Gloria looked at her mother with a hint of fear. Mom, where are you going? It's the weekend. We thought you'd be home. Exactly, it's my day off, so I plan to relax. But... Alana gave her daughter a questioning look, and Gloria turned around and called out. Justin, come here. 
Mrs. Smith watched with interest as her son-in-law came out of the room with a travel bag in his hand. He asked irritably. What is it, Gloria? You know I'm packing my things. Gloria replied. It seems there's no need to pack. Mom is going somewhere again. Her husband even dropped the bag. What do you mean? We have to leave in an hour. Mrs. Smith realized that her children once again hadn't bothered to inform her that they were going somewhere. It seemed she hadn't made herself clear enough that she was no longer their servant. I don't understand something right now. Did you lose your apartment keys or something? Are you going somewhere? Because I'm not stopping you. Justin cleared his throat. The thing is, we were planning to go to the countryside with friends. Alana nodded. That's a good thing. Go ahead, of course. Just make sure to buy something for the mosquitoes, Willie can't stand them. Justin and Gloria exchanged bewildered glances. But we weren't planning to take Willie with us, only adults are going. Well, how about that? And what about you too? You have a child, don't you? Mrs. Smith perfectly understood everything and even imagined what she would do with Willie while she had tea with Vanessa, but she didn't want to give up that easily. We thought you would stay with Willie. Lately, you haven't paid much attention to your grandson. Well, you're exaggerating. I believe that children should spend more time with their parents, and such trips should be coordinated in advance. Alana started getting angry, and Gloria immediately sensed the change in her mother's mood. Mommy, please forgive us for not warning you. But if we refuse, we will let everyone down. Gloria looked at her with such pleading eyes that Alana waved her hand. What should I do with you? Willie, get ready. We're going to Vanessa's. Willie burst out of the room with joyful shouts. He loved Vanessa because she was fun and allowed him to do everything. Mrs. Morgan opened the door with a very mysterious look. Oh, what people have come to see me. And I knew it. I baked a cherry pie, just the way you like it, Willie. The boy immediately disappeared into the kitchen, and Mrs. Smith took off her coat. What's wrong with your face, Vanessa? I'll tell you now what the boys dug up for me, and you'll have the same reaction. Mrs. Smith stared at her friend. I understand your teenage geniuses found something interesting? Let's go, I'll make some tea and tell you everything. Well, let's start with the fact that Mr. Scott is not local. He moved here recently. Alan interrupted her. I already know that. You didn't have to put on a mysterious face. Vanessa looked at her mysteriously. You know, not everything. Mr. Scott's parents used to live here. Then, at one point, they suddenly left for distant Alaska. And now, pay attention, when did they do that? Alan didn't understand anything. So, when did they? A month after your brother disappeared. Yes, the effect was even better than Vanessa could have expected. Mrs. Smith turned pale so much that Vanessa reached for the valerian. Do you want me to put some drops for you? No, there's no need. I'll be walking with my grandson later, he'll smell it. But I still don't understand. Do you think they took Conan? But why? And most importantly, he's Carl, not Conan? Come on, Alan. Why are you acting like a child? Apparently, Mr. Scott's parents were quite well off. So, do you really think they would take the boy and leave him with their name? Yes, maybe you're right. But why? Vanessa shrugged. I don't know that, but the kids told me that Mr. Scott is their only son. And doing the math, it turns out his mother gave birth to him at 44. Do you understand what I mean? Alan shook her head again. No, I don't understand. Most likely, they didn't have children and it was already too late to have them. Everything clicked in Alan's mind. Oh, that's a really interesting story. By the way, his son started some business in another city, his father helps him, but his daughter-in-law threatens to file for divorce. Because she doesn't like that city, apparently. Alan sat silently. Honestly, she now understood even less what to do. How could she go to her boss and find out if he was her brother or not? 
Alan. Alan. Are you asleep? Mrs. Smith woke up. No, sorry. I was lost in thought. Alan, what do you plan to do? I don't know, Vanessa. He might not want to listen to me. I'll lose my job, and still won't find out anything. That's true. But you can't just go on living like this, can you? Alan nodded. So, go and find out, we'll figure something out about the job later. Don't forget that people like him come to me, like you wouldn't believe. An hour later, Willie got bored, and Alan started getting ready. Lila was giving her final advice in the hallway. Don't bring up this topic right away. Show him a toy first. Then tell him how you saved his grandson, and only then everything else, so he doesn't kick you out immediately. That way, he might actually listen. Alan, who had already put on her coat, suddenly lowered her hand. Vanessa, what if it's not him? Well, Conan could have lost a toy, given it away, or something else. He could, of course. But if you don't talk to him, you won't find out. Alan understood that Vanessa's words were right. But right now, Lila could only think about how painful it would be if Mr. Scott turned out not to be Conan, almost as painful as when her younger brother disappeared. Grandma. Grandma. Alan snapped back to reality and looked at her grandson, who was pulling her hand. What is it, Willie? Let's go. Let's go quickly. The competition is about to start. Mrs. Smith sighed. Well, all right. They had been standing by the railing for half an hour when someone nearby said. Grandpa, look. There she is. Alan turned indifferently at the voice. She hadn't thought these words were about her, and then she froze. Before them stood the same boy, and behind him was her boss, Mr. Scott. Hello. He also looked at the cleaner in confusion. Hello, Mrs. Smith. My grandson told me that a woman saved him. But I never thought that woman would be you. She weakly smiled. Nonsense. I didn't even understand how it happened myself. I'm sorry. I should probably thank you somehow? No, there's no need. It's completely unnecessary. But I do have something to give you. The boys were already playing tag, and Mrs. Smith and Mr. Scott approached an empty bench and sat down. What is it? This little horse. Carl took the toy as if it were a precious treasure. Thank you so much. This toy means a lot to me. And then Mrs. Smith made up her mind. I know. Because it's been with you since your early childhood, from a past life. He looked at her in surprise. Did your grandson tell you that? She shook her head. Mr. Scott, if you have the time, I would like to tell you a story that happened in my family over 40 years ago. She could see that the man turned pale and immediately began to speak. When she finished, Carl's fingers, clutching the toy, turned white. Without lifting his gaze, he started talking. I had a very loving family, not just in terms of having everything, but in terms of being loved and loving in return. The only thing that bothered me a little was that I couldn't remember my early childhood at all. But by the time I was 14, I somehow got over it because other things in life kept me busy. But then, when I was over 30, my wife passed away. I was so shocked, so devastated that I withdrew into myself. I didn't care about my son, my mother, by that time, she was all I had left. Questions started popping up in my mind. I didn't really seek answers because I attributed it all to childhood peculiarities. Somewhere, I even read that if a child goes through some stress, the brain can simply block out that period. It took me several years to get back on my feet. But as soon as I did, my mother fell ill. I tried to spend as much time with her as possible, knowing that she would leave us very soon. We talked a lot, and one day, I asked a question. Mom, nothing happened to me in my childhood, did it? I can't remember anything. And my mom, she suddenly burst into tears. She said she couldn't take that secret to her grave. She started telling me how she and my dad wanted children, but nothing worked out. Back then, medicine wasn't as advanced as it is now. 
Eventually, they had to resign themselves to the fact that they couldn't have children of their own. They even considered adopting a child from an orphanage, but for some reason, they hesitated. On that day, they finally made up their minds. However, they decided to drive to a nearby town instead of adopting from the local orphanage. My dad miraculously hit the brakes just in time because he saw a child sitting on the road. That child was me. My mom said they briefly saw a woman running across the field nearby, but they didn't chase her because she seemed unstable. My mom picked me up, tried to comfort me. There was no village nearby, and they couldn't understand where I came from. But at that very moment, my mom decided that I would be better off with them than with parents who could allow such a thing. I couldn't believe it. I begged my mother to tell me it wasn't true because my whole world crumbled in an instant. But she kept talking giving me all the details. I moved to this town only because they were originally from here. Alan gently touched his hand. So, you're my brother, Conan. He looked at her strangely. Then he stood up. I'm sorry. I don't know. It's all so strange, even scary. Of course, I came here hoping to find out something, but now it seems like I've learned too much, and it doesn't make sense in my head. Mrs. Smith, I have to ask. Why did my mother treat me this way? Alan stood up. Mother? No, you're thinking all wrong. Mother went to the bathroom for just a minute, asked me to watch over an elderly woman. They found her later. It turned out she was not in her right mind. They occasionally released her from the hospital, and she aimlessly rode the trains. She didn't even remember taking a child out of the train. Although someone recognized her. She didn't remember where she took him. Mom got sick right away. There wasn't a single day when she didn't go crazy. By the way, there are only four of us in our family. You have another brother and sister. Mr. Scott clutched his head. Nonsense. This is some kind of nonsense. This doesn't happen. There's no such cinematic plot in real life. Honestly, Alan was expecting a different reaction. Now she watched in bewilderment as the man, holding his grandson's hand, quickly walked away from her along the path. She smiled. Well, nothing to worry about. He can be understood too. He's an oligarch, she's a cleaner. The main thing is that now she knows for sure that Conan is alive and well. Alan called Willie, and they, of course, didn't miss the ice cream stand, and headed home. On Monday morning, she called Mrs. Turner and said she was sick. She also said that they should look for a new cleaner because she was quitting. But, Mrs. Smith. Everything was going well. Maybe you're not satisfied with the salary? I'll talk to Mr. Scott, and I'm sure he'll meet my demands. No, there's no need. It's just family circumstances. I'm sorry, Mrs. Turner. Forgive me. Her daughter came into the room several times. Her son-in-law even came in once. Finally, Gloria couldn't take it anymore, and they all came into her room together. Mom, what's going on? Are you sick? Mrs. Smith sat on the bed. What's the fuss about? I'm not going to work today? Her son-in-law stepped forward. You're mistaken, Mrs. Smith. I just received my salary even more than I expected, and Gloria will get her salary soon. So, if you're feeling unwell, we wanted to tell you not to worry about anything." Alan looked at her son-in-law and daughter in surprise. Tears welled up in her eyes. She didn't have a chance to respond because someone rang the doorbell. Justin went to open it, and Gloria sat down on the bed next to her. Mom. Seriously. Are you not feeling well? Yes, no, Gloria. Everything is fine. Really? Alan didn't tell her daughter anything. She felt embarrassed, not for herself, but for Carl. Here was her brother, and he ran away from her immediately. It seemed like he was afraid that she or they would ask for money, and she didn't need his money. The main thing was that he was alive. Her son-in-law returned to the room. His eyes were almost as wide as saucers. Mrs. Smith. Someone. 
Mr. Scott is asking for you. Alan stood up, tears quickly running down her cheeks. Gloria looked at her in fear, and Carl entered the room. In his hands, he held a huge bouquet of roses and stopped a couple of steps away from her, saying. Well, hello, sis. I'm sorry it took me some time to digest all of this. He hugged Alan, and they stood like that for a long time. Alan cried, and Carl had his eyes closed. Gloria shifted her gaze from Carl to her mother and then to her husband, then finally asked. I don't understand. Sis? Alan wiped her tears away and smiled. Well, meet each other. This is Gloria, your niece, Carl. This is Gloria, my daughter. This is Justin, my son-in-law. And you already know Willie. Carl hugged Gloria, then Justin, leaving him in a state of shock. Well, I'll introduce you to my son too, they'll be here soon. My grandson finally got his skateboard, but he already fell off it. Right now, dad's taking him to the hospital to get an x-ray and bandage his knees. He turned to Alan again. You know, Alan, right now I feel like I remember you. I can't say for sure, but it seems that way. The evening passed noisily. It turned out to be very easy with Carl, his son immediately became interested in Justin's work, and when the conversation turned to computers, they went to another room. The thing was, Gloria's cousin had started his business in that field. Gloria already knew that her brother was single again, that his wife had left him as soon as she found out she had to go to a remote place or stay at her father-in-law's house, leaving their son with his father. So, Gloria was actively going through all her unmarried friends in her head because a good man had to be married, no other way. Carl and Alan were looking at old and new photographs. And Larry, Julie, where are they? What happened to them? Can we meet them? We rarely communicate. As soon as they started dividing the inheritance on the day of the funeral, they went their separate ways. Alan, promise me that we will definitely visit them too. At least once, and then we'll see how it goes. Okay. When Mr. Scott, his son, and grandson were about to leave, Alan quietly said. Carl, maybe we should go to the cemetery to visit our parents. Yes, Alan, definitely. Sorry, but what happened to your husband? I saw in the photo that he was standing in front of our company. Well, that was before your company even existed. Management cut corners on everything, there was an accident, four people died, and they blamed it all on them. Carl frowned. You mean nobody received any compensation? Exactly. He looked at her. You know, even though I wasn't there at the time, I still believe in justice. Can you find the contact information for the relatives of those who died? Of course. Let them know I'm expecting them on Friday. Two days later, they stood by the graves. Mother was strict. She was busy. You understand, right? There were four of us, and dad left us. She just didn't have time for sentimentality, but she loved us very much. Because when you got lost, she couldn't return to a normal life, and in the end, she went mad. Carl knelt in front of their mother's grave. Mom. I don't remember you at all, but I'm sure I loved you very much, just as you loved me. I found my way back, albeit a little late, but I promise I will come to see you often and tell you how I lived without you. Alan wiped away her tears and smiled. I'm sure she sees everything and is very happy for us, 